Hello, and welcome back to Management 201. Today, we're going to talk about managing teamwork. So you all know that teams have become a crucial element of organizational life. And uh, at some point, as a manager, you will probably be in charge of different work teams and work groups. So you want to understand what you need to do on your end to make uh, teamwork effective. And before that happens, uh, you will probably be a member of different teams yourself with different supervisors. So you want to understand what it is that they try to accomplish, how to help them out with that, uh, understand uh, where your contribution may be particularly important. And if there are things that need to be corrected for the benefit of the team, which ultimately will lead to benefits uh, to your own career, uh, it's a good idea to identify those things now and uh, start practicing uh, you know, the, the skills you need to build up as early as possible. So today we'll uh, talk about uh, a few uh, specific items. We'll talk about the difference between groups and teams, right? Uh, we tend to use the words interchangeably, but they are not the same thing, at least not in the management context. And I want to make sure that we are all on the same page and we understand what those differences are. We'll talk about group performance model, group structure, group process, and stages of group development. Nothing comes uh, fully formed uh, from the get-go. Uh, you need to understand uh, how groups, groups go through this evolutionary process, what management styles are most uh, appropriate for the groups depending on the stage of group development. And I will also talk about the transition from groups to teams and how to best facilitate it. Finally, because groups imply the working together of many people, Every now and then you have to have some points of contact where the common agenda is discussed, where plans are made for the future. And obviously those meetings should be managed. So we'll talk about how to structure an effective uh, meeting management practice. And again, what you can do personally to make sure that uh, once you're in a position to affect those meetings, that you do what is appreciated and valued by other team members. We'll start by distinguishing between groups and teams. Groups are definitely a broader uh, notion. So every team uh, is a group, but not every group is a team. So groups, basically, whenever you have more than two individuals working on uh, the same project, on the same task, uh, you have a group. So uh, they can be as small as two people and they can get actually quite large. Teams, on the other hand, are typically on the smaller end. So they have between five and 12 members as a rule. Most effective teams are probably between five and nine individuals. This is the number that is easy to manage. This is the number of people that is fairly easy to relate to, to get to know well. And so, uh, you know, uh, when we talk about, you know, I think about sports teams, think about your basketball team, your favorite team or ice hockey team. Uh, it's, uh, it's fairly compact, right? The members may be replaced, but if you think about the number of people um, at uh, ice rink uh, at any given point in time, what we talk about five players and one goalkeeper for each team. So uh, that's, that's, that's rather manageable, and uh, this is what works in many different circumstances and in many contexts. Within a group, there's typically a leader who directs it. Teams tend to share leadership. So even though there may be a person with a formal authority, the decisions are made together, the leadership task is distributed, and um, uh, different people at different points in time may assume some specific leadership responsibilities for a, uh, you know, some sub project or certain initiative within the team group. And uh, that is a very important distinction between teams and groups. Um, jobs tend to be more shared within a team. So everybody is kind of expected to do everything and uh, you can lend a hand to someone, to your team member, if, if that is required. You may expect help from every team member if, if you require help. Within groups, uh, that is more isolated. So you typically have your specific task, you stick to it, and that's it. 
you don't go outside of the roles uh, that you have been placed into. And uh, this is really more uh, mechanistic in nature than teams that are more organic. In terms of accountability and evaluation, uh, within a group, there's always a leader that assesses your individual performance. And the leader, I guess, is ultimately accountable for the project success. In teams, success is everybody's responsibility and uh, everybody assesses everybody else. So it's a mutual accountability, it's, uh, it's shared responsibility, it's the sense of belonging that groups often do not have. Rewards in groups are based on your individual performance. In teams, they have both individual component and a group component which again serves to bring the team together to make sure people you know, share the same goals that they try to push in the same direction. So they are a lot more cohesive in this sense. And um, in terms of the objectives that uh, groups and teams pursue, for groups, they are given those objectives by the organization itself. For teams, in addition to those organizational goals, because of the shared leadership, uh, teams may have their own objectives created by and shared by the team members. And in terms of the autonomy, so again, groups are typically directed. They're directed by the manager, by the person who is put in a position of authority. Teams are typically self-directed. So lots and lots of autonomy there. And then there's this mid-level, the semi-autonomous groups or teams so, uh, you know, this is obviously a combination of the two, but uh, because there is now a general uh, transition across organizations from groups to teams, uh, you start seeing more and more groups adopting some elements of autonomy to develop this team spirit within group members and move more towards this uh, team end of this continuum. Uh, group performance is typically seen as a function of four distinct uh, elements. It's the organizational context, group structure, group process, and group development. With respect to organizational context, uh, we have actually covered a lot of that already in our prior lecture. So here we'll look at the organizational environment, and you remember, right, the general environment and the task environment. So the industry, the competitor group, uh, but also general trends that affect all firms and all industries. Uh, mission matters here a great deal. And you know how ambitious it is, how well formulated it is, will determine how well groups function. Strategy is an absolutely key component of your group performance model. So strategy really determines uh, you know, how you run the company, what are the organizational goals. So it kind of informs um, many other elements that we discuss uh, within this group uh, conversation. It also reflects things like mission and the environment. So strategy is definitely important. Culture, organizational culture. We have touched on that in our earlier lectures as well. Organizational cultures, if you remember, they can be strong and weak, uh, positive, negative, uh, healthy, unhealthy. So you definitely want to be a part of the organization that has a strong and healthy organizational culture because that will make sure that, uh, again, everybody shares the same values, everybody knows why they do what they do, and everybody is equally interested in reaching those objectives. If you have a dysfunctional kind of culture, then, uh, you know, I think you'd be pretty miserable with an organization and uh, cultures are incredibly hard to create. So uh, you probably should try to find another group to join, another organization to join, rather than trying to change the organization from within if it got to the point where the culture is both strong and unhealthy. Uh, organizational structure, Right, so this is something we talked about in a previous lecture. Uh, you remember the differentiation and coordination, uh, functional departmentalization, customer departmentalization, 
geographic and product. So uh, all of those issues matter a great deal, especially because many groups now become cross-functional. So you need to understand how the company is organized and what kind of effort is required to make people from different functions to coordinate their activities, to see themselves as a part of this same group. So uh, structural issues are definitely key and also systems processes. This is something that we've discussed in some detail during our first lecture and something that we'll keep discussing throughout the semester all the way to the last chapter. When we talk about group structure, uh, we talk about group types, size, composition, leadership and objectives. And I'll talk more about each element in just a couple of minutes. With respect to group process, we try to identify group roles, norms, cohesiveness, status, decision-making and conflict resolution, because all of those have implications for how a group actually performs. And again, we'll uh, talk about that in some detail uh, later today. And then finally, uh, what we tend to not really focus, about uh, focus on much is the group development stage. It turns out that the kind of leadership you need for early stage groups, the groups that are going through the forming stage, the group creation stage, uh, the requirements for leadership are quite different compared to group that is already you know, well-formed and performing to the best of its ability, uh, and definitely a group that is going through the termination process. So again, this is something that we'll introduce and talk about in some detail. So back to the group structure. There are five elements to it that matter. The size of the group, the composition of the group, group objectives, leadership, and type of the group. So uh, with respect to group size, uh, obviously larger groups would be harder to manage. Uh, they are not quite as cohesive as some other groups uh, that are smaller in size. And, um, you know, there are definitely benefits to increasing the group size because the number of perspectives you have represented goes up, right? So the more opinions you have represented, the higher, the better potentially the solutions would be that you will come up with as a group. At the same time, there comes a point where adding more and more perspectives becomes detrimental, right? It becomes a true challenge to reconcile uh, the viewpoints Discussions take forever. The likelihood of developing a conflict goes up. So, you know, there's always this golden mean and you want to keep that in mind. Uh, composition of the group. Here you will look at things like, uh, you know, homogeneity, the, the, you know, how similar are the skills, experiences, demographics, education of the people who you have on a group. And in many ways, you want to have people that share some important aspects, why right? they may, you know, maybe they all graduates of St. Cloud State University. It doesn't really matter if you guys have uh, graduated from different programs, there will always be something that unifies you together, right? This whole Husky spirit uh, in this specific case. So if you happen to be working for the same organization or for different organizations and you brought together in a group, then having this homogeneous element uh, that most of you share will help glue you together as a group and it will be beneficial for group communication processes, for decision-making, for, for almost anything. Um, when it comes to a functional background, Typically, you want to have a group that is cross-functional in nature. You want to have someone, and if we talk about maybe manufacturing businesses, someone who knows the manufacturing side, you know, someone who knows engineering. You also absolutely have to have someone who has some background in marketing because engineers tend to, uh, you know, be searching for elegant, technically complex solutions and they don't really have much interest in meeting the needs of the customers as long as the solution is technological element. For the marketing people, the problem is quite the opposite. They wanna make customers happy without realizing or understanding or caring how technologically infeasible uh, could be 
what they want to sell to the customers. So you want to have those multiple perspectives represented. Group composition matters. Group objectives, obviously, you know, you want them to be shared among group members. You want them to stay consistent with the group's stra uh, strategies, structure even, uh, uh, mission. So uh, that is essential. Uh, with respect to leadership, um, we may talk about different kinds of leadership, uh, you know, formal and formal. Again, this is something that we have discussed in some detail less time. And um, you want to basically make sure that, uh, you know, leaders have this leadership style that is conducive to having healthy discussions, to uh, uh, that encourages people participation. Uh, leaders have to be able to yield to others when necessary, right? So they don't necessarily need to do all the work themselves. They don't necessarily need to just, you know, delegate everything to other group members, but they have to create the environment that is conducive to responsibility sharing, that is empowering for people that allows them to, to take charge of, uh, specific elements of group projects. So leadership becomes uh, a very important element uh, that determines group success later on. So uh, as you think about group structure, leadership is definitely a very important dimension. And finally, when you think about group types, um, there are different ways to uh, analyze uh, those. We may distinguish between formal groups and informal groups. Formal groups are always sanctioned by the organization, right? So maybe the group creates, the, the organization creates this task force that is specifically assigned a particular project that is very important to the organization. It includes people from multiple departments. There's definitely a person in charge. So, um, you know, to give you an example, uh, when we as a department seek to hire another faculty member, we would always form a search committee. It will have multiple members, ideally from different backgrounds. There will always be a uh, search committee chair and there will be a um, formal decision by the department to create that group. Group may also be informal. Right? So people may self-organize. They may discuss their joint problems together, they may try to find solutions for the benefit of the organization, but also because they are passionate about, you know, particular issues themselves. And um, it may or may not be work related. It could be that within an organization, you just have a subgroup of people who are interested in chess, right, or, or playing tennis or golf or bowling. And this may become the basis for the group formation. So obviously, this is a very informal group. But even such groups, you want to encourage them, they may have some pos positive contributions to the success of the overall organization. Mm -hmm. uh, we may also talk about command groups and task groups. So command groups, again, they, they tend to be formalized. Uh, there's, a, there's definitely structure to them. They typically pursue a specific uh, agenda item, uh, so they want to accomplish something. And they tend to be more functional. So you're more likely to see a command group created uh, you know, out of research and development people who just start uh, on a new technological project than necessarily a cross-functional group. Cross-functional groups, again, they may also be created as necessary. But again, within a command group, there's always a person who is in a leadership position who then tries to facilitate the discussion among team members, and that's that. Task groups, they are kind of more transient in nature. Uh, they are almost always cross-functional. Uh, you typically, well, you distinguish between, again, two kinds. Task force, which is a very temporary in nature development. So, uh, you know, imagine again, as a school, uh, we have to go through accreditation visits by different accreditation agencies. And, um, you know, the business school may create a task force, 
that aims to uh, make a strong case to the Crenton body for renewing our accreditation, right? That definitely helps with our ranking and standing and whatnot. Standing committees, they are created for problems that tend to reoccur. So, um, you know, uh, think about academic integrity committee. It's not that issues arise all the time that need attention from that committee. But you know that throughout the organizational life, such issues may arise. And so typically when you create such committee, it is with the understanding that it is here to stay. It's not necessarily, you know, what it does is not necessarily a part of everybody's specific job requirements. So it is outside of what you typically do. And usually when people join those standing committees, there is this applied, implied service term. So you may have a three-year term to serve on a specific committee, meaning that one-third of the committee members are being re-elected every year, right? So this way, there's continuity, there's a, you don't get specifically tired of serving on that committee, uh, and yet you do have an opportunity to contribute. And finally, the newer development is the so-called global virtual teams. So this is a team where members are geographically distant, yet they work on the same assignment, the same task, uh, towards the same objective. Depending on how distant they are geographically, we may talk about international, global, or we may also look just domestically, purely domestically on a situation where people brought together to work together on a specific problem without ever meeting in person face to face. And uh, obviously with the COVID uh, situation, uh, I think global teams are definitely a lot more prominent now than they used to be. And I wonder if uh, the situation will ever scale back in terms of this uh, remoteness, uh, even if the pandemic ends and uh, life kind of goes back to normal. Now, we also need to understand uh, group processes because they determine to a substantial extent how successful the group will be. And here we'll look at several things as well. We'll look at group roles, group norms, cohesiveness, status, decision-making and conflict resolution and the way those processes are structured can make a group a lot more or less effective. So with respect to roles, there are three kinds of roles that people may take within a group. The first group of roles, the so-called group task roles, they are the ones that have to do with the objective of the group. Right? So if you, are, if you join a group that is tasked with a new product development, so you have to have people who understand innovation, technology, who understand markets, who probably understand finance and to an extent, who can simply bring their knowledge, their disparate knowledge together and work until you know, a certain breakthrough is reached. There are also group maintenance roles. These are the roles, uh, so these kind of roles people assume to facilitate the interaction between people with different functional backgrounds within a group. So, uh, you know, think of those people as uh, facilitators. Both group task roles and group maintenance roles are very important to ensure group success. Unfortunately, there's a third kind of roles that you can often find within a group that people choose to play, and those are self-interest roles. So in many cases, people on the group see that as an opportunity to advance their own case. And uh, they would do anything and everything to serve, you know, to go towards that goal at the expense of other two. So uh, your task as a manager is you definitely want to maximize the group task roles within your group and group maintenance roles. And you want to minimize or eliminate uh, self-interest roles. Right, the extent to which people uh, get into those roles. So you want to introduce some uh, uh, checks and balances to make sure it doesn't happen. 
Group functioning depends a lot on the norms that are developed within group. And norms are basically just shared understanding and shared expectations with respect to how the group functions. If you do have strong norms, it means that uh, you know group can function almost on its own. People share objectives, they know what kind of behavior is expected, which kind of behavior is not tolerated, and people typically tend to comply, you know, they tend to succumb to peer pressure, they tend to fall in line. So if you happen to have norms that are conducive to uh, productive functioning, then many of your problems have kind of solved themselves. You may also be in a situation where a group has accepted norms, has generated norms that are disruptive in nature. And this is something that you need to change. Uh, it's not easy to change organizational culture. So norms would be considered part of the organizational culture, but sometimes it is absolutely necessary to do. And for that, sometimes you need to break the group down or at least replace the person in the position of authority and uh, make sure that whoever comes next uh, brings with him or her a specific management style that can address the kind of problems uh, created by, by the you know, other group members. You want the group to be cohesive. You want people to definitely self-identify with the group. And that can be achieved through different methods. So one of them, as I said before, you want to make sure that the group is homogenous enough that people have enough in common to see themselves as, as belonging together. So could be anything, again, your functional background. So two engineers will definitely you know, be happy to work together, whereas an engineer and a marketer may have some conflicts. So uh, having homogeneity helps. Uh, background homogeneity helps. Uh, gender, this is you know kind of funny, but uh, it may uh, help or hurt the organization. And um, so there are many dimensions on which you may try to emphasize homogeneity or heterogeneity to ensure that the group is cohesive. And obviously the, the degree to which individual members subscribe to the group objectives uh, may affect how cohesive the group becomes. Group status. Uh, most people within a group strive towards attaining a higher status, meaning they want their opinion to be listened to, heard, respected. Uh, they want to, uh, I guess, it's just a recognition. And recognition is something that uh, all of us as individuals, we wired to want. We don't want to be ignored. We don't want to be irrelevant. And uh, unfortunately, what happens is that people with higher status, you know, their contributions may be very valuable, but they may be discounting the contributions of others. Many years ago, I was part of the group uh, that was led by a truly legendary person. So uh, extremely smart, uh, terrific experience, uh, great personal background. Uh, and basically the guy was succeeding at anything and everything that he would start. Unfortunately, that person had absolutely no respect for other people's time. So he could schedule a meeting for you know, Saturday noon and so you have to get through you know, the entire city to get to where his office was. And you get there by noon, and then you sit and wait until 2 p.m. And then he finally shows up and says, well, you know what, sorry, I've been busy and I didn't have a chance to really look into what we were supposed to do. And uh, you know, when I was uh, part of that group that was before cell phones were very uh, widespread. So uh, there was a lot of uncertainty, a lot of waiting. And, um, you know, sometimes people who attain this higher status start being sort of disruptive to the group. So that is a, that is a tension within the group that you need to be able to recognize and you need to find some solutions for. The way that decisions are made within the group may also determine to a significant extent how successful groups are. So sometimes decisions are made by the group leader. Other times the group itself 
may reach a decision. It doesn't mean that one way is necessarily better than the other, so you always have to look at the context within which the decision is being made, but generally you do want to provide some autonomy to the group. If nothing else, uh, team members should be able to recommend a solution to the leader, and then the leader, while making that solution, uh, you know, the smart thing to do would be to basically listen to the team members and to incorporate their insights as much as possible. So obviously there may be other considerations that you as a team leader or group leader are aware of than the rest of the team members may not know about. And so that gives you a um, justification for maybe going against the group. But if that happens too often, then the group again loses cohesiveness and after a short while uh, you'll need to invest significant efforts to rebuild it back. And there's also a lot to be said about conflicts within the group. So we typically believe that uh, the best strategy is to avoid conflicts. Uh, in the organizational context, this may not necessarily be the case. The only consistent way to avoid conflicts is to acquiesce, is to never challenge what other mem members are offering, which means you kind of you go with the flow. You've probably heard the term uh, groupthink. When people basically would select uh, the, you know, the, the first solution that everybody can agree on and do not challenge themselves further to find a better solution that would have been truly beneficial for the company. So uh, for that reason, having some level of conflict within groups or teams is actually preferable. Obviously not too much because then it becomes disruptive, but having a constructive conflict that is not directed at individuals, but at the issues at hand, that is actually beneficial. So you wanna structure your team group so that uh, you know possible conflicts are not necessarily you know nipped in the bud that you do give people an opportunity to vent frustration with some processes so that then you can work on finding a solution so that is uh, important with respect to group cohesiveness i already introduced some of those things so uh, you want to have shared objectives for different group members. Uh, this is probably the single most important piece. You want people to identify with uh, each other and, and, and accept group project uh, as, as a legitimate purpose. If that does not happen, if the people do not believe in the same objective, then uh, A, you're going to be miserable and B, the organization will not achieve its purpose. So um, again, from my personal experience, uh, back some, I know, maybe 21, 22 years ago, I was working for a company that was decidedly low tech. And the company initially was uh, a, a trader in the sugar market. So there was absolutely nothing uh, technologically advanced about it. And the company owner has decided that he wanted to create these information systems for the sugar market participants that would provide them with relevant information that would enable them to predict, you know, which way the prices may move, which will allow to connect, uh, you know, different groups, uh, different players on the market. And um, secretly, most of us left at that objective. So we, when, when we were added to the group, uh, the group also had some IT people who were actually quite excited about creating uh, the project. Uh, it became a sort of, uh, you know, this artificial existence for mo most of us. So except the IT people and the company owner, we were just window dressing or pretending to subscribe to the same ideology. But in reality, it's not that we were actively sabotaging it, but we were never quite a unified and cohesive group. And that project has now been realized. So the company and the owner have spent substantial resources into making it happen. 
and nothing happened. So uh, you want to make sure definitely that people share objectives, those people who are on the group. Uh, it is also very important that as the group moves along, that some objectives, you know, sub-level objectives are achieved successfully. Success breeds success. You need this winning spirit, team spirit. So you absolutely have to have those lower level goals, probably the ones that are easy to reach, to just stimulate the group cohesion processes. Group size, I talked about that. Homogeneity, talked about that. And participation. You want the group to be open uh, for all members to participate. And this is kind of a chicken and egg problem. So you want there to be the environment when, where everybody is, you know, feels welcome to participate. And then if everybody is well participates, then the group itself kind of functions better. So a lot then becomes a responsibility of the manager to create that kind of environment. So you remember the group maintenance role, the facilitation role. So that becomes very prominent, very important uh, to ensure that this actually happens. And whenever there is any talk of competition, it has to be competition with outside groups, not inside the group, right? So it's, it's gotta be us versus them. If there is this situation, you know, the us versus them, it puts some pressure on a group, it bonds group members together, and this is very positive, very beneficial to ensure group cohesiveness. Um, with respect to group development stages, we typically differentiate between four different uh, stages of group development, forming, storming, norming, and performing. And, um, you know, this is how they typically go over time. Uh, the interesting thing here is that depending on the stage of group development, the management style required to successfully manage the group would differ. So when the group is just being formed, obviously the level of group development is low. People are kind of committed to group success, but in terms of competence, they're fairly low, right? No one really knows yet what they're doing together. If this is the case, you have to provide a lot of direction to the group. Uh, no one really needs support in just yet, right? People just need to be told what to do. And the best management style here is actual autocratic. I know we don't like talking about autocratic leaders, yet there are contexts where strong autocratic leadership is necessary to ensure success. So this is one of those contexts. Uh, at the second stage called storming, here people start coalescing together. Right? So at this point, uh, the group has already ran into some issues. People's commitment to the group tends to wear off. People get scared, upset, unsure about the future, yet their competences start growing. So here is where you need to provide a lot of support to people to build back their level of commitment. You also need to support them as they try to attain more and more competence. But because the group is still in this, you know, forming process, uh, you still need to provide a lot of direction. So uh, in, in many ways, this is probably the toughest period uh, in the group development process, right? This is when a lot of people get disillusioned and this is where you may lose the group altogether. At the norming stage, so you remember, right, norms, they kind of emerge, they are shared expectations, uh, what's acceptable, what's not, means that people have st stuck together long enough to start seeing themselves naturally as belonging together. So some standard for what's acceptable, what's not, is starting to emerge so the kind of management here that makes the most sense is participating. You encourage people to participate. You solicit their participation. You seek their input. And uh, one thing I forgot to say, so in the storming stage, uh, the best management style is consultative. So, uh, you know, even though you provide high directive, high support, your, 
your, your primary tool of uh, effect in the group is by lending advice where necessary, right? So whereas in the first stage, you simply give direction, um, you tell them what to do. Second stage, you give them advice. Third stage, you invite participation from them. You invite their opinion. And so this is where typically competence has built up quite substantially and group starts functioning quite well. And then finally, at the performance stage, where the level of group development is actually outstanding, uh, people are truly committed to it, the competence is at its height, and um, you, they don't really need any direction or support, they function themselves effectively, then what you want to do as a manager, as a leader, is to empower them, is to sort of make them believe they can create their own goals as a group and come up with their own solutions and, and pathways, trajectories to reach those goals. So what is interesting here is dependent on the stage of group development, the preferred management style would differ. Yet we would often leave the same person in charge of the group from group forming to group performing, which is possibly a mistake because people have their own unique preferred management styles and they cannot switch between them quite so easily. So the natural implication here is that depending on the stage of group development, you need to promote different individuals into the management position, which may be problematic because if you're this autocratic leader who has created the group, you may want to see it through until it succeeds, but you're not the right person for the job, right? So it's very important to communicate it very clearly, even to people in the position to manage the group, that their role within the group has the beginning point and the ending point. And it has nothing to do with their success or lack thereof, that you will simply reassign them later on to create yet another group. Right, because otherwise you will be subjecting the group to a management style that is far from perfect, depending on where they are in a development trajectory. Now, there's also a, a process you need to go through to help the group transition from being just a group to becoming a team. Um, and um, you know, for that, you need to definitely create different kind of leaders uh, you have to uh, focus on the management functions like leading, planning, organization, and control, and you remember all those. Uh, but there has to be a formal process. There has to be a trajectory that the groups go through to become teams. Right? And some of those steps will be prescribed, but by what we discussed already, right? The group size and, and homogeneity and you know, shared objectives and all that, others can only emerge on their own as you make in that transition. So it's not really possible to give the, you know, recipe of how to transition a group of people into becoming a team. There are general suggestions consistent with what we have discussed up to now that you'd better be aware of as you try to transition more towards the team-based uh, work environment. Um, as with individuals, with teams, rewards are definitely important. Uh, there are different kinds of rewards that you may consider, uh, financial and non-financial, um, skill-based pay. Um, so you may try, you know, I guess as a group leader, you would probably want to reward people who may do more than one kind of task. But if someone is a team player, if someone is jack of all trades, you definitely prefer having those people around and you want to reward them so that others on the team see that this is appreciated and start developing their expertise in different areas as well. What you also want to do and emphasize is uh, you want to reward people who share their knowledge with other team members. If sharing knowledge becomes the norm, then this definitely helps the group cohesion. 
it helps with the group expertise level and overall it helps the organization tremendously and then finally because you know groups typically see themselves as owners of the project that they're dealing with there has to be some sort of a gain sharing or profit sharing right so we talked previously about non-financial rewards well it is a terribly powerful idea to also have some financial rewards attached to the project that the groups are working on so that is uh, essential when you run a group you have to be meeting together as a group it doesn't really matter face to face or virtually and planning meetings becomes a very important task i've been to a great number of meetings that were very poorly planned it turns out there's a template for how effective meetings are run so there always have to be objectives for the meeting but there has to be an overarching goal if there's no goal for people to meet then it makes no sense to meet in the first place uh, you have to know who the participants are in the meeting and who is assigned what so people have to know their roles they have to know their task you don't want to invite people uh, into a room where they have no idea why they're there and what's expected of them there has to be an agenda right people uh, will do a lot better in a meeting when they know what to expect when they have received this agenda beforehand so they had some time to think through the agenda items they have something to contribute to the discussion and if there are some questions that are you know touchy and potentially delicate that they have had the time to think through what their position is and how to best communicate it so that is important you have to specify the date place and time for the meeting uh, there has to be obviously someone who runs the meeting right the leadership someone responsible for following through with the agenda and to for, for moderating the discussion and in many cases there has to be technology involved especially now right with covid and most of us working from home and having to zoom in into different meetings so uh, you know that has to be thought out prior to the meeting and if there are technological requirements you have to make sure that people have access to the technology that they are comfortable working with the technology when you start conducting the meeting so again you identify objectives you cover the agenda items and it is also very important at the end of the meeting there has to be the summary you have to summarize what has been accomplished and uh, typically different people will get uh, individual assignments you have to review those as well to make sure everybody's on the same on the same page and that people become accountable to each other especially when they see that what they are required to do is necessary for someone else to do their job right so uh, the summary and review of the assignments is important to make that happen and um, unfortunately in most cases especially as the group uh, gets large you're going to have some problem members right? people who are always silent who are not contributing or people who would never shut up the talkers people who have uh, well, who have the tendency to stray away from the agenda who try to introduce all those uh, unrelated items uh, board members who just sit there you know not participating and and making it very clear to everyone else that they'd rather be elsewhere people who argue not necessarily because they feel strong about a particular position but just because they like the attention because they like argument uh, especially you know when the stakes are low people engage in argument uh, quite willingly and then you also have those freeloaders people who kind of there but they never volunteer for anything they they try to minimize their involvement so they actually become a cost to the team and for each of those problem member types you should have strategies to get them involved to curb their involvement if they are too actively involved to keep them on track to keep them you know focused on the agenda to have them participate and to to stop arguing for the sake, sake of argument and to actually contribute so the textbook does identify different strategies that you can employ there 
I will not necessarily go to discuss those in detail, but uh, you know, I guess the good suggestion is to be constructive and think those potential problems through before the meeting starts, so that if you identify the issue, you may uh, end it before it becomes a problem for everybody else. And with that, I will end my today's lecture. Uh, thank you for the attention, uh, and I will see you next week.